parents and older individuals beware, there's a very common, overwhelmingly mild disease on the loose, and it just may make you sneeze, cough, or even feel tired and lethargic. Welcome to Natural News with Danny Curtin. Thank you for joining me today. Respiratory syncytial virus, better known as RSV, causes a very mild cold more than 99.9% of the time. But if you watch TV, you've probably seen ads like this. What are folks 60 and older up to these days? Getting inspired. Volunteering. Playing pickleball. According to the CDC, 99% of the U.S. population has been infected with RSV at some point in their life, most before the age of two, and they have built up quality immunity. In fact, just like rhinovirus, RSV is known to cause about 10% of the total cases of the nearly 1 billion common colds in the U.S. every year. However, RSV can lead to more serious respiratory illnesses like bronchiolitis and pneumonia in higher risk patients. But is that something we should all be highly concerned about? Or can we take a fearless, holistic approach to managing this overwhelmingly mild disease? Well, I'll give you the data and you can decide. RSV was first identified in 1956, not directly from humans, but from chimpanzees. Shortly after its discovery in chimps, researchers noticed that children were getting sick with the same disease. What a coincidence. Ten years later, the first trial for RSV took place. Unfortunately, developing a for a mutating virus proved to be quite difficult. The children in the trial not only failed to be protected against RSV, but they also developed enhanced disease when naturally exposed to the wild virus. Even worse, 80% of the children in the trial group were hospitalized and two died. The trial was stopped and no product hit the market. This became a pivotal lesson for drug makers since the antibodies produced during the trial were suboptimal. That is, the immune response created antibodies that did not stop the infection. Instead, the antibodies created were incorrect because the virus mutated or they were non-neutralizing. Now, non-neutralizing antibodies are created in response to less dangerous pathogens, like those created when you're exposed to pollen or grass. Now, you can see how having a seasonal allergy response to a respiratory virus could be problematic. Now, to this day, many unbiased scientists and doctors agree that creating effective modalities for these types of viruses is next to impossible. They explain that mutagenic viruses change frequently. So the resulting immune response has been and will continue to be ineffective. They also express serious concern about the creation of enhanced disease, along with more aggressive variants. This phenomenon is credited with having created the notorious C19 Delta variant. Okay, with what we know now, should we be worried about RSV? The short answer, no. Stress and worry are two of the main causes of illness especially when it comes to viruses. Since viruses take over your cells, stress makes your cells easy to hijack. Additionally, the experts don't typically mention the fact that they don't know the total amount of cases per year because the illness is so widespread and almost always extremely mild. Instead, they stick to reporting the number of kids and adults that are treated and or hospitalized. But don't worry, they promise that this tactic is not to scare you. So if we don't know the total amount of cases, how do we know what the real risk is? Well, we don't. So how do we make an informed decision about possible treatments and preventatives if we don't know the real risk? Well, again, we don't. So how do we assess our risk? What we can do is take the data that we do have, and we can put those numbers into perspective with other known risks which will make it easier for us to understand and approach without the stress. What you need to know is that for adults over the age of 65, the CDC attributes 14,000 deaths a year to RSV. 
keep in mind that this cohort has a large amount of comorbidities. For example, when someone dies of a heart attack in the hospital, but they test positive for RSV, the death will be attributed to the heart attack and RSV. Sound like any other disease? So it's safe to assume that these statistics are inflated, but even with these suspect numbers, with roughly 54 million adults over 65 in the US, the annual risk of an individual in this age group dying from RSV is about 0.026%. For children under five, the CDC estimates there are between 100 and 500 deaths per year attributed to RSV infection. Now, given that there are approximately 20 million children under the age of five in the US, the annual risk of a child in this age group dying from RSV is between 0.0005% and 0.0025%. Putting these numbers into perspective, statistically, children and adults are roughly five times more likely to be killed in an unintentional accident than they are from RSV. So if you're worried about RSV, but you're not worried about dying in a car wreck or falling off of a ladder, you may want to reprioritize your concerns. Now, this leads me to the next big question. After 60 plus years without this type of medicine, why is there such a big rush now? We've always been taught that RSV was mainly a risk for young children and infants. Why are we seeing ads targeting adults? Did RSV get worse? What changed? What changed is that this type of medicine development became much easier. Now, Instead of generating an immune response to the entire virus, like natural immunity, drug makers are able to generate an immune response from a piece of the virus, which is a very specific protein. This tiny protein isn't put inside of you. Instead, the payload contains messenger RNA, which hijacks your cells and tricks them into producing this small part of the virus. The idea is that you'll begin to generate an immune response to the pathogenic protein your cells just created. Now, this technology is supposedly a major breakthrough in virology. However, there are still many questions about safety and efficacy. We're told that our cells only produce these proteins for a short amount of time. However, some research shows that this time period is different for many people. For some, it's relatively short, and for others, there doesn't seem to be an end. Aside from the production breakthroughs, drug makers and government employees stand to make a fortune. Researchers from the NIAID, the government, are responsible for patenting the stabilization process and the genetic code for the RSV F protein, which the newest approved RSV drugs are designed to act on. Essentially, drug makers have to use the government's patent to make these new RSV products, which means NIAID employees will receive royalties. And do I need to explain the rest? Drug companies can blatantly see that if government employees stand to make money, then it's quite obvious government programs like Medicare and Medicaid will become the primary customers. Paying drug companies and government employees with your tax money. It's not a conspiracy, it's just business. So now you're becoming an expert. You know the history, the stats, and why new drugs are popping up. Let's dive into the newest approved treatments. Three new products have been greenlit to prevent RSV-related lower respiratory infections. One tailored for expectant mothers, another for children and infants, and the last for seniors over 65. Recall during the pandemic, the initial new mRNA modalities showed promise. However, as mutations emerged, the narrative shifted from a drug aimed at halting the pandemic the old definition of this type of drug, to one focused primarily on preventing hospitalizations. Hmm. All three new drugs use mRNA in some capacity to generate an immune response to the RSV F protein. Two of the drugs stimulate the response in the patient's body, while the third introduces exogenous, animal-created, foreign antibodies into naive patients, a.k.a. babies. Let's start with pregnant mothers. The goal is for expecting mothers to pass immunity to their unborn children. In trials, children born to mothers who received the new treatment had fewer severe RSV cases than the placebo group in the first 180 days of life. 
According to their own numbers, this treatment was shown, on average, to have 67% efficacy. However, there was a 37% increased risk of preterm birth in the trial group, with more than double the risk of neonatal death. These are the numbers from their own study. They aren't my opinion. And with these increased risks, manufacturers don't seem to be worried. Next, the newborn treatment. Despite the immunity transfer from mothers from the first new drug, there's a push for newborns to also receive a new monoclonal antibody drug immediately after birth. Monoclonal treatments are typically used for autoimmune diseases, some cancers, and aren't necessarily considered everyday safe solutions. The new RSV version is created in guinea pig ovaries, since newborn immune systems aren't capable of creating the desired antibodies. When used on infants, this new treatment was shown to have 75% efficacy in preventing severe RSV-related illness. However, three babies in the trial group died. If you recall, the original RSV trial in the 60s was halted after only two babies died. Notably, this new monoclonal treatment seems to be in a class of its own when it comes to regulation. This new drug is not a vaccine. However, drug makers have been granted liability protection. So if your child gets hurt, you can't sue the drug maker. But what makes this drug even more special is that if and when injuries need to be reported, they don't get reported into VAERS, the CDC's own adverse event reporting system. Instead, they get reported like every other type of drug. VAERS is like kryptonite to drug makers because this gives users a little more transparency when it comes to adverse reactions However, that's bad for business, and lucky for the makers of this new treatment, they don't have to worry about liability, and adverse events are much harder to find. Sounds like they get to have their cake and eat it too. And finally, for adults over 65. Similar to the new drug for expectant mothers, this drug trial reported 80% efficacy against RSV infection. However, half of the vaccine group experienced systemic reactions like fever, headache, and muscle pain, which is funny because those symptoms sound just like RSV. But even when we only look at the 80% effectiveness, the absolute risk reduction, which is the overall risk for people in this age group, it only translates to a mere 0.26% decrease. That means that the NNT, or number needed to treat to prevent one bad outcome, is 385, which means, according to the trial, we are knowingly going to give systemic adverse reactions to at least half, 193 people to prevent one more serious outcome. These numbers are also misleading due to the fact that the trial excluded those most at risk, like people with compromised immune systems. Aren't those people going to be the primary target audience for the drug? Yes. If you or someone you love is a candidate for any of these new medicines, please share this video or this data with them. Patients in all of these trials were only followed for a year. We do not have any long-term data on the safety of these preventatives, and it is very hard to discern what the results are that truly matter, like hospitalization, death due to RSV, or all-cause mortality. What's going to happen when people start mixing RSV, flu, and the pandemic medicines? Not to mention any of the other drugs recommended, especially to older people. We simply can't know, and sadly, regulations don't require the same amount of safety data that they used to. Okay, what can we do to protect ourselves, our children, and our parents or grandparents? Well, there are countless natural remedies, over-the-counter solutions, and preventative measures. However, I'm going to stick to the ones I use and that have supportive research. We'll start with the simplest things first. As you probably know, but I'll say it anyway, hand washing is essential during cold and flu season. If you have a newborn or very young infant, make sure you breastfeed if you can, and also try to avoid large groups of children during peak illness season. Next, you need to manage fear and stress. Stress produces higher levels of cortisol, which reduces the number of white blood cells that help fight off pathogens. Make sure you take breaks from the news and social media. Take walks in nature with family members. Get a pet, work out. Try to tune out the normal day-to-day -day for at least an hour a day. And definitely, don't be scared of getting sick. That doesn't mean you don't take care of yourself, but treat your body well and it will do the same for you. Next. 
there is some very compelling research about oral and nasal hygiene. Using antiseptic or antimicrobial mouthwashes can have a major impact on preventing viral replication. Additionally, nasal sprays or rinses do the same in the nasal pharynx. These are two of the easiest and cheapest natural remedies that you can make habitual. During the cold and flu season, my family and I regularly gargle with mouthwash and use saline nasal spray, especially if we've been exposed to an illness or if we're in a large crowd. And personally, I use a saline nasal rinse every day, especially when I come home from the gym. Now moving on, dietary supplements. If you've watched any of my previous videos, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but vitamin D plays a crucial role in both innate and adaptive immunity. As many of you know, we all get far less sun during the fall and winter, which can lead to lower vitamin D blood levels and even vitamin D deficiency. Without a doubt, low vitamin D absolutely increases the risk of respiratory illnesses. Personally, I take between 5 and 10,000 IUs a day during the winter. You should always get your levels checked and follow the directions on any product you might be taking or giving to your child. Now, similarly, vitamin C has anti-inflammatory, antioxidant, and immune-enhancing properties. I feel great with a gram or two a day, but again, that's just me. And zinc, one of the primary fighters of viruses, is essential for immunity and has been shown to be a powerful inhibitor of viral replication. I prefer products that provide raw sources. Now, moving away from vitamins and minerals, one of my favorite remedies for anything, from cold sores and styes to cuts and infections, colloidal silver, which many people swear by for its antiviral properties, and studies show it has a direct effect on RSV. I like nasal mist products, so I can rinse my nose and use silver at the same time. Now, if you do wind up getting sick, you need to manage inflammation and mucus. If these get out of hand and it's difficult to breathe because you can't stop coughing and you're extremely congested, you might wind up in the hospital. For young children, using a cool mist vaporizer can reduce coughing, which will make breathing much easier. Also, saline nose drops can be used to soften thick mucus and a suction device can help clear tiny airways. Age-appropriate over-the-counter expectorants like Mucinex can also be effective in breaking down and expelling mucus. Obviously, if there's a serious issue, go to the hospital. And finally, I'm always going to talk about the benefits of systemic enzymes. In this case, specifically the enzyme serapeptase, which not only supports normal inflammatory levels, but it's also a natural mucus liquefying agent. In studies, serapeptase has been shown to reduce inflammation as well as the weight, viscosity, and elasticity of mucus, making this enzyme an amazing one-two punch for mucus-filled, inflamed airways. Serapeptase has only been studied for use in adults. I'll leave you with this. Don't let those who stand to make the most money scare you. When you're scared, you get sick. Instead, use common sense to protect yourself and your family. The human body is an amazing machine. Take care of it, and it will take care of you. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up and make sure to subscribe so people can truly stay informed about natural and effective remedies so they can take control of their own health. Again, I'm Danny Curtin. Thanks for watching. I'll see you on the next one.